Hello and welcome to the complete guide of the Jabava London system. In this video, I'm going to be taking you through everything you need to know to go out and play the Jabava London system yourself. And that means that we're going to be looking at the conceptual idea of the opening. We're also going to be looking at the main lines and theory of the opening for both sides. And we're also sprinkled throughout the video going to be taking a look at Grandmaster game examples so you can really take home the main ideas of the opening, but also the middle games and End games that will arise from the Jabava London system. There are timestamps below if you want to skip around the video. You're watching the Chess Geek channel. We upload every other day, so make sure you subscribe. And without any further ado, let's jump straight in to the Jabava London. Now, this was an opening that was named after Badur Jabava, who is credited with creating this opening. The opening itself is d4, d5, and now we play bishop to f4, which you might know as the London system. And after black responds, we play the move knight c3, and this is the important move of the Jabava London, where we really get away from the main London system. In the main London system, the play that you're going to usually get is putting the pawn instead on c3. You put the pawn on e3, the knight on f3, the bishop on d3, and you create this sort of very secure uh, pyramid with your pawns on c3 and e3 and d4. Now, this is very safe and solid. However, it usually is quite passive and it doesn't allow for quick play. With the Jabava London system, we're sacrificing a little bit the security of our center because this pawn is not going to be as secure as it usually is and therefore black tries to punish this often with the move c5 but in exchange we're going to get quick attacks and very quick initiative and specifically what you might notice is that this knight is heading towards the b5 square where with the aid of the bishop on f4 we're going to put immediate pressure on the c7 square and try to win some materials from the beginning. Now, another cool thing about the Jabava London system is that it's very flexible. We're gonna continue our development like we usually would in the London system, and that means we're gonna put the pawn on e3, the bishop on d3, the knight on f3, and these three moves lend very nice to an attack on the king side. The knight can come to g5, the bishop is permanently heading towards this h7 square, and so we always have this attack that we could try to brew up on the king side, but we also have the ability as I mentioned, to quickly go for one on the queen side. So this flexible way to play means that black will have to defend on both sides of the board and they won't be able to really launch uh, as much of a center attack or center control as they would want. And so let's see this in action and look at some of the more concrete lines. So the main move that you're going to see in this position is e6. They're defending their center, preparing to develop and castle. We're going to respond with the move e3. And our idea is, of course, to develop our own pieces, but also to prepare to put the knight on e5, which I only recommend you do once that square is defended. Because if you prematurely go for knight to b5, that could be a common way for you to lose a little bit of your initiative. Because if you go, for example, knight b5 here, well, they're going to be able to go queen a5, and because we haven't played e3, the knight is not defended, we're going to have to retreat that knight, lose tempo, give them the upper hand. And so going back, this is why I always recommend, for example, after e6, first go e3, let them, you know, then go c5, and now we can go knight to b5 far better because, again, the knight is defended, so queen to a5 is fruitless. We can go c3, a move we anyways want to do because it secures our center, and we still have the same threat of uh, going ahead and placing the knight on c7 with a fork. Now, how can they defend from these threats? Well, they're going to have to play the move knight a6. So let's take a look at how we can deal with this move knight a6. Let's back up for a second, because again, the move queen a5, throwing this in, doesn't yield them anything, and if anything, it only helps us. So let's look at knight a6 here. Now, one of the important things to understand about this position is that the move knight b5 wasn't only the intention of, you know, forking them and winning material. But also, we wanted to freeze up their position because now the knight on a6 is frozen. It can't move anything. It doesn't have a future because if it ever moves, they're going to hang c7. Similarly, this rook is frozen. If it ever moves, um, they're going to hang this pawn here. It also can't move anymore. And so what we're doing basically is freezing their queenside pieces, making it very difficult for them to develop. 
And that's the extra bonus of us going for this quick initiative. It's very difficult for black to get their pieces out successfully. We're going to continue here by playing c3 anyways, like I mentioned, which is why queen to a5 is such a bad move. We're going to play this anyways. And the idea now is that after they develop their pieces, we're going to develop our knight as well, knight to f3. They're going to go, for example, bishop to d7. And here comes a nice little move, a4. And so this is one of my big recommendations here, where the knight, as I mentioned, it serves the purpose of completely freezing up their queenside pieces, so we want to keep it there. And one of the things is that if they have to take this knight away from the game, that is a massive concession, because now we're going to be able to either take with the pawn, but here I think it's better to take with the bishop. We have the two bishops, we have more initiative, um, they have to play passively, return their pieces, and now something positive is good and will happen for white. I mean, we can continue by considering knight to e5, although perhaps they can go knight to b8 and barely survive with a6 coming. So alternatively, we can go queen to e2 and just put pressure on this knight. For example, they castle, and already from the get-go, we're up upon. We have a dominating position, um, and we're very soon going to castle so they don't have any counterplay. Now, I do want to go back for a moment because they don't have to take this knight, but once again, if they don't, how are they going to get this knight? If it ever moves, they hang c7. If this wreck ever moves, they hang a7. Again, their pieces are frozen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we go back to after we played knight to f3, we just looked at bishop to d7, where I showed a4 as my recommendation. They can also play a move like queen to b6, but now with what you've just seen, a4 still works. We, we still defend the knight. It serves the same purpose of securing this knight on this very dominant post here. And another important property of this knight, which I kind of didn't mention before, it can't be kicked away. I mean, they don't have the luxury of going a6 because this knight can never move. They've already committed with c5, so they can't go c6. This knight is a permanent thorn in our opponent's uh, side. So one of the things that I wanted to now show was a game example from this exact position where you can see how a position like this can develop and how dominant white's pieces really are and how we can take this position and transform it through a middle game into a win. So the knight hops in to e5, both knights super strong. We develop our bishop. We're then going to play uh, this nice tactic, knight to c4 here. We're hitting the queen. If they take, they're going to hang this knight as well. And now they have some crippled pawns as well. And so their queen moved in the game. White decided to now capture and now place the knight on d6 utilizing the knights and the minor pieces here, just dominating on the board. And you can very quickly see how how important uh, this position became and how crucial white's attack uh, really started to look. I mean, this becomes devastating very quickly. You can already see the bishop and the queen and the knight working together. And very soon, you're going to see a nice way to get the rook into the game as well. You see the move here, h4, opening up this h-file for the rook, and that becomes very clear after this trade of queens. Well, wait a minute, the queens are gone. Is the attack on? Not at all. And the nice thing that White noticed here is that the rooks are going to stack and continue to put permanent pressure along the h-file. And this is again devastating. There's already a threat if they move their bishop to take on g6 and then mate them. I mean, alternatively, if they played what they played in the game, knight to f8, we're going to crash through with g6. I mean, this is truly a, a beautiful display, checkmate. So this was a nice example of how quickly an attack can develop from white from seemingly nothing. I mean, it's just superior piece placement that slowly develops into a greater and greater initiative and becomes an attack. Now, let's take a step back because I didn't mention an alternative option that black has, and that is the move c6 here. The move c6, strategically speaking, is more solid in the sense that they don't allow the knight to come to b5, and they're defending their center more, but at the same time, it is a massive concession. If you recall, the big difference between the Jabava and the normal London is the move knight to c3 instead of the pawn coming to c3. And the reason the pawn on c3 is usually a good way to play in the London is because that is uh, trying to preemptively stop the move c5 from coming with a huge effect. 
And so with the, the pawn committing to c6, the move c3 was not really necessary anyways. And so the knight here on c3 is an improvement from the London because we've guaranteed the knight on c3 without them playing c5. Because again, if they play c5, we go into those lines that we previously saw. And so this small move order was really powerful for us because we forced them into passivity without forcing ourselves to commit with the move c3. A nice nuance there that means that we're going to have a healthy advantage. And so we're going to continue by playing knight to f3. They're going to develop their bishop. We can sink that knight right into their uh, position here on e5. Um, you know, if they play a move like bishop d7, there's already a nice tactic. This is a, a common one in many positions. King takes, they hang their bishop. And if bishop takes, oops, they hang their queen. And so going back, instead of bishop to d7, they're going to castle, let's say. But now, after they castle, we continue. Bishop d3, we can then go queen to f3. And now I want to show this position developing in two different ways. If white continues and insists on, con on maintaining this pawn structure and they try to just develop their pieces, well, because they're so passive and we have superior development and more space, our attack is just going to play itself. For example, we castle, we can then go queen to g3, already threatening some nasty things. They can defend that, but now queen to h3, notice they can't take because of mate. This is a very dangerous position. And if their knight returns, we can continue with g4, launching the pawn. You know, this could continue with bishop g5, and then queen to h4. Now we're hitting the knight. They have to go g, uh, king to g7, but now f4. I mean, this is such a fun position. Look at this. The knight, the bishop, the queen, the bishop, all in the game. This knight has the potential to reroute into the game. We have the ability to go f5 in these positions. I mean, we are continuously and completely dominating over the board. Now, alternatively, instead of going knight to d7, black, if they're a great player, will realize in this position that they cannot let us continuously just attack them and they have to try to attack the center uh, in some way, right? And so they're gonna play c5, but note that c5 in this position is a move that they played not because you know they have an initiative and a huge plan, it's a move out of necessity. They had to play this to get some level of counterattack. But again, it's a little bit too late. We already have a dominating position and I'm gonna show another game example now that begins with knight to b5 and knight takes d6. And in this game, what happened is that white just won a pawn over here. And after they won a pawn, they were very happy to just go into an endgame and trade down, win the endgame up a pawn. And so I'll show this, a very nice display from white here, trading all the pieces. They have an endgame where they have a superior pawn structure and also an extra pawn, which is a nice little formula to success. It's not a guaranteed win. And if black plays objectively perfect, perhaps they can draw, but practically speaking, I mean, white has a huge advantage here, and that becomes really clear when you look at some of these moves, and indeed, they crash through, and in this position, they're losing the rook, and black resigned. And so you can see another way to play this sort of position where if you get a quick advantage in a way where the opponent has to just give away a pawn to, in order to survive, one of the things that you can do is very calmly trade down pieces, go into an endgame, and very, very convincingly win that endgame. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the final thing that I want to show in the Jabava London is what if they don't even go d5? Because they have the ability to play knight to f6 and try to go for a king's Indian uh, sort of setup where they're going to fianchetto their bishop. But one of the things about this sort of position is that we're going to continue with the same spirit of the Jabava. So we go knight to c3, they go bishop g7, we go e4, they're going to go d6. And if you're familiar with the king's Indian defense, you're going to see that this is quite similar, but there's one key difference. We don't have the pawn on c4. Now we're going to continue with a move like knight, up, knight to f3, and I'd keep this difference in mind for a second, because what you're going to notice is that once we develop all of our minor pieces, we have a completely risk-free position. We have more development, more space in the center, superior piece placement, and no downside whatsoever. Usually, with us first playing c4, black gets some level of counterplay because our pawns gain a lot of space, 
but they're also in many cases overextended. And that is exactly where Black gets a level of counterplay and compensation. They're going to be able to put pressure on our overextended pawns, but here we don't even have that problem. I mean, playing e4 and d4, that's not overextending. We just have a perfect amount of space. We don't have the pawn on c4, so in some cases we could support our center with c3. Uh, the knights support the pawns for now. We're going to castle... I mean, this is one of those positions that is just a dream position where you're not really going to ever be in risk of losing. And if you just follow basic principles, you're going to do great. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is wrapping up the video for today. Hopefully you enjoyed this video where we really learned how to tackle the Jabava London system with the white side. You essentially, in the Jabava London, as a reminder, get huge initiative against the queen side, have the potential to gain huge initiative and play as well on the king side. And combining that level of flexibility, it is a very, very uncompromising way for white to play and get a great attack from the beginning. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new around here. Like this video if you learned something new from here and don't want to miss out on more content in the future. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.